Fizzing. Nice to see you. Bye. And I'd like to welcome the live stream. If ever you're around, please come and visit us. Thank you, Father. That was awesome. That was great. All right, you can all be seated. that came to me a couple weeks ago. I talked about it in my youth side last Thursday. And it's a verse that really sticks to me. And I think the verse is very important because it shows up three times in the Bible. You got, in three books, it talks about the same thing three times. There's other verses that does the same thing, but this one really connects find connects with us. So if we put it, I'll show you what I mean. Put the first verse up. So right here, he's talking about Jesus. So I can read over there. <laughs> he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, now this is Jesus praying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as your will. Let's go to the next one. This is this was Matthew. Basically, this was what Matthew described what he heard. Now let's see what Mark describes what he heard, what happened. And he said, Jesus again, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now let's go to the next one. This is Luke. This is how Luke remembers how to say it, okay? Saying, Jesus again, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours will be done. Now, everybody's looking at me saying, well, what does this do with tithing? <laughs> It has everything to do with everything we actually do, okay? How would I explain this? You got to think, when Jesus was here on earth, he was not only fully God, but he was fully man, okay? So Jesus had a flesh, just like we have a flesh, okay? Jesus was tempted, just like we are tempted. So if you look at Luke here, I like the way Luke describes what he sees. You see the first sentence says, Father, if it is your will, <laughs> think about this. This is pretty much what every prayer that we do. When we, when we do something, we always say, oh, if it's your will, Father, please. You know, but this is Jesus' flesh speaking. Now watch him turn this around. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. <laughs> you need to find out what the will of God is, okay? This ties into everything, your tithing, your health, everything that you do. You need to find out what the will of God is. Don't take it for someone. Don't take it your own opinion. See, a lot of people make up their own opinions on stuff. Go find out what the opinion of God is about it. Go read your Bible. Check it out for yourself. And I tell you, you'll find it's amazing. Okay? So, today I want you to think about that when you're giving your tithes. That it's not your will. Your, it's not your will giving tithes. It's basically what the will of God is. Okay? And you find that out by yourself. Go back and find that out. And it's awesome. Love this verse. This verse shows you how Jesus really connects to us. You know? So, um, we can take up the offering. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that we have your word, Father. We have your word, Father, that it comes alive when we read it, Father. That we are blessed by it. That every time that we read it, Father, there's a different revelation that comes out that's there for each and one of us, Father. 
that it speaks to us. You're speaking to us through your word, Father, and we thank you for that, Father. Father, bless everybody who ties today, Father, and that they tie with a giving heart, Father, that it comes from the heart, Father, that it's a relationship between them and you, Father, and we thank you for that, Father. We praise. Amen. All right, so just before we hit announcement, just want to let you know that the cafe will be closed after the service because it's a uh, holiday weekend. Uh, happy Canada Day, by the way. <laughs> so we can put the announcements up. Go ahead. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm excited for today, and it's not because I get to hear myself. It's a true story. I don't mind hearing myself, to be honest with you, because, it, see, she's laughing, but the thing is, is I know what I'm about to say, and it's not my words, so. How many of you are ready to take down some giants today? Because trust me, I am, and I believe me, if you're ready, it's going to happen. Because I always talk about whatever you expect, you're going to receive. And I tell you, uh, I'm expecting. Before I go into this, and I really get started here, I'm going to forewarn you of one thing. I'm going to read a lot of scripture at the start, and then that's it. So remember what I say. <laughs> but before I do that, I wanted to mention something. And uh, where's Pastor Gary? There he is, okay, sorry. I know you're there. I, I was looking now everywhere for you. As some of you know, some things are missing on this side of the church. She just said it. See, I will tell you this. I've heard a couple people go, ah, oh, well, I guess that means. Ah, oh, well, I guess that means. <laughs> and I was sitting there, and when the first time I heard it, what I said was no, 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 no. Somebody's preparing our land. Now, I will tell you, I thought it was just me. See, because I have a tendency to, to I, I'm one of these people that I'm like, no, 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 because I know and I stand. But this morning, Pastor Gary came up to me, and he said this to me. He said, there's some people that were seeing that land, this tree's coming down, they're going, well, I guess we didn't get it. And he said, you know what God showed me? He said, the government bought the land. And the government's going to landscape the land. And the government is going to put in an ambulance depot so that when we get our land, our land is prepared. It is landscaped. And we have what we need right there. Church, God is saying something. It's not just me. Don't get discouraged and don't let the opposing voice, and I'm going to get into that, come in. 
Just wanted to tell you that. Now, I'll tell you why I'm excited for this morning. Because what you're going to hear is not what I prepared. <laughs> because I prepared a sermon and I thought it was pretty decent. And then as I, I, I was at home and I was preparing it for myself, I was like, nah, Shannon, something's not, something's not clicking. I've got to go back to this. And so Thursday, I said, God, something's not. And then all of a sudden, boom. And I wrote out this that you're about to hear this morning, and I'm telling you, church, it changed me. I, w I oh. And this is how I want to start. Because I want to get your perception of what's going to happen today in the right place. Because this is how God told me to start it. And I'm not preaching on this, but this is how he told me to start it. In Luke 4.18, it says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach, for he has sent me to announce, release, and pardon those that are captive, to recover sight and to set free those who are oppressed, those who are bruised, those who are crushed, and to proclaim this day, the day of salvation and the favor of God to abound greatly. Be ready, church. Here we go. And again, I'm going to read a lot of scripture. So we go to 1 Samuel 17. And did I start you in verse 20, do you know? Okay, because I, I have 23, so I'm going to start at verse 20. And I'm going to do my best to make this very entertaining in reading it and not, not sound dry. So David rose up early the next morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host going forth to the battleground shouted the battle cry. And Israel and the Philistines put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his packages in the care of the baggage keeper and ran into the ranks and came and greeted his brothers. And as they talked, behold, Goliath, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, came forth from the Philistine ranks and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. So Goliath has been talking smack against Israel. And now David has heard, and I just lost where I was. Thank you. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him, terrified. And the Israelites said, have you seen this man come out? And King James says, have you seen this giant? Surely he has come out to defy Israel. They know what he's doing. And the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, and he will give him his daughter and make his father's house free from taxes and service in Israel. And David said to the man standing by him, what shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is the shepherd talking to the armies. And the men told him, thus shall it be done to the man who kills him. Then Eliab, so this is David's eldest brother, heard what he had said to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why did you come here? With whom have you left the sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and your evilness of your heart. For you came that you might see a battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not a harmless question? And David turned away from Eliab to another. And he asked him the same question. And again, the men gave him the same answer. And when David's words were heard, they were repeated to Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and will fight him. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go fight against this Philistine. You're only an adolescent. He's been a warrior from his youth. And David said to Saul, Your servant has kept his father's sheep. And when there came a lion or there came a bear and tried to take the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and I smote it and delivered the lamb out of his mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard, and I smote it, and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And then Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David girded up his sword over his armor, and then he tried to go, but he could not, for he was not used to it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I am not used to them. And David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook, and he put them in his shepherd's 
bag. It says lunch bag, I believe. I didn't expect that, so it kind of threw me off. You can't make a lunch bag sound intense. His lunch bag. <laughs> in his pouch and his sling with, and it was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, the man who bore the shield before him. And when the Philistine looked around and saw David, he scorned and despised him, for he was but an adolescent. Second time. When a healthy reddish color and fair face. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defied. This day... The Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and cut off your head. And I will give you the corpses, I will give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, that all may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saves, not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into God's hands. And when the Philistine came forward to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. See, I got excited when I read this. Because if you think I'm going into the typical story, you're wrong. If you think that I'm going into, he took down the giant, that's not where I'm going. Because there were some things that jumped out in this that got me so excited. And some things got me a little concerned. You see, one of the first things that jumped out to me is when David got to this camp, there was grumbling and there was fear in the camp. You see, one of the first things that they said to him, and I will get to it, is, do you see the giant? That makes me think that there was already talk going through the camp. Because if somebody comes into the camp, and I'm picking on Timmy, I'm not really picking on you, but I'm going to say Timmy's name just so you know. If Timmy came into my camp, I'm not going to tell Timmy, oh, here's everything that's wrong. Look at my house. Do you see this? Do you see this, Timmy? Do you... My first reaction is to greet him and welcome. But their first reaction was, do you see the giant? Which tells me that in their camp, these men were already talking about the giant that was coming. The giant that was defying them for 40 days. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't like he just popped up this morning. So for 40 days, this was happening. This is the second thing that popped out to me about that. Who are the men in the camp? They were warriors. They were soldiers. Why were they not doing what they were called to do? For 40 days, they knew they were God's army. Saul was anointed of God. You can go back and read it. Saul was anointed king. Israel was God's army. And for 40 days, this man mocked God, and the men who were warriors, who were soldiers, were called of God, were sitting in their camp doing nothing. See, those were two things that jumped out to me. And this is what kind of got me concerned because of the fact that how many of us are called to do something, but we're content with sitting in our camp while somebody is defying God. Don't get me wrong, I'm not getting down on you. <laughs> because we have a contentment, an apathy that we can come into church and it's about me. That we can come into church and go, oh, but if I do this, what's going to happen to me? We're happy sometimes with coming into church. And you say, you know what, that's a little bit harsh. You want to know why I can say that? Because that was me. See, when I first came to this church nine years ago, and Shannon can back me up on this, and she will tell you what I said. See, I've been serving my whole life in church. I've been serving. My mom has been a worship leader since I was born. My whole life I've been in church. But here's the thing. When I first set foot in this church nine years ago, I said to Shannon, I don't want to do anything. I said, nobody knows me here. Not a soul knows me here. And I want to come into this church, sit, and at the time I sat roughly, it was between two parts, roughly where Tyler, Tyler and Temi are, and then back around where Rose was, is. You weren't where there, you are there. 
And, and that's where I sat. And I said, nobody knows me. I want to come into the service, sit there, service done. I want to get up and I want to go home. If I don't want to show up on a Sunday, nobody's going to miss me. And I like that. I'll come in, I'll go. I don't care. This is why I can say this. Because it lasted a couple weeks, a month. Because I sat there and I found out there was a need. And somebody said, we have this, but we don't. And God said, what are you going to do? And I said, you know, I know what I'm going to do, God. If you need me, I'm here. It's true. I didn't go, yes, God, I got a chance to serve. I was like, uh, just, all right, just want you to know you have a need. I haven't told you this, but I know how to do this, and if you want me, I'm here. And they were like, oh, okay, go do it. I tell you, I wasn't happy. I wasn't, I'm sorry. But it started to change. And I will tell you, for nine years, I haven't stopped serving. Because now if I find a need, I'm coming for that need, even if I, I have to make time. But we've got to remember it's not about us. But here was the thing, is as soon as David got there, the first thing that they said to him was, have you seen the giant? See, where was their gaze? Because here's the thing. It reminded me of when the Israelites were told to go to the promised land. And they were told to scope out their land. And they were told to go and have a look at their land. And when they got there, they scoped out the land and were like, Oh, the grapes here are phenomenal. However, there's some giants. And we can't beat them. Now here's my question. Who told them that they couldn't beat them? See, God didn't say, go and tell me if you could defeat the giants before you take your promised land. God said, go and possess the land. But see, their gaze was somewhere where it shouldn't have been. God didn't tell them that they couldn't defeat the giant. It's the same thing as when you look at the Israelites here. They were in their camp. At no point, I can guarantee you, did God say to them, I've called you guys. You are mighty warriors of God. I have positioned you. But there's a giant out on the other side of that hill that you can't do anything with. So sit back in your camp and let him mock me. You go ahead and do that. See, the thing was, was their gaze was not where it should have been. They immediately looked at the giant instead of looking at what God had called them. And they, there's a reason why I think they did this. And this is my opinion, but I will back it up. Is that, you remember how I said there was grumbling in the camp? You see, when God calls you to do something, there's always going to be a voice. And there was grumbling in the camp, and somebody started saying, we can't take out that giant. And see, when that person started saying, we can't take down this giant, there was a choice that had to be made. Were you going to give ear to that grumbler? Or were you going to turn and know what God has called you to? You see, when David first came into the camp, if you notice, he walked up to the gentleman, and one of the things I found really sweet, and this is a side, side thing, is that when David entered the camp, it says that he saluted his brethren. David paid honor where honor was due when he first stepped into the camp. He didn't go, oh, my brother's fight here. I can come in. This is good. First thing he did was he paid honor to the men who needed and deserved honor, and then he went in. But the first thing that the man said to him, <laughs> he said, oh, hang on now. Yeah, so the man said to him, have you seen the giant? And if you look at it, David didn't even acknowledge that. 
David didn't go, oh yeah, yep, yep, there he is, there he is. He came out and defied. David seen it, but then David continued because David was on a mission. And then it says Eliab, David's brother, came up to him. And, and there was a point that I put an inflection on a word, but when you look at this, his brother came up to him and was like, why are you even here? I see that there's evilness in your heart. And when you look at that verse, in verse 28, if you can throw up verse 28 so they can see it. And we'll, sorry, we'll, we'll read 28, we'll go 29, 30. I know I said it wasn't going to, but his eldest brother comes to him and says, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, why did you come here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and evilness of heart, for you came down that you might see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not a harmless question? And in verse 30, what did David do? And David turned away. You see, opposition was coming. There was grumbling in the camp. Somebody was saying, you can't. And David immediately went, and he turned, and he went to the next person and said, what shall be done with this man that defies? And somebody else says something, and David turned. See, David wasn't giving an ear to the grumbling that was happening in the camp. You gotta understand, <laughs> you may not be doing the grumbling, but are you giving ear to the grumbler? Because I will tell you this, if you allow a comment to come in, a voice will come out. What that voice is is your choice. Do you get what I'm saying? If somebody comes against you and goes, I don't understand why they're doing that. Why did they buy that? Why are they? Why are they? If you sit there and go, well, you know, they, well, don't even give it an ear. Because eventually what's going to happen is you're going to step out and you're going to go, hey, Curtis, so... So-and-so said. See, the grumbling, I'm telling you, when opposition is going to come when you're moving in God's will, I can guarantee you, don't give an ear to the grumbler. Do not give an ear, I'm warning you. Not for my sake, for your sake. You're going to understand because immediately after David turned from his brother, and you, you can take that off. Immediately after David turned from his brother, what happens? Saul came to him and said, you can't do this. You're only a youth. And David went, no, no, no. See, opposition wasn't stopping. Opposition wasn't going, okay, he turned away from this voice. Let's leave him alone and let him do his thing. Because see, the enemy was scared. And dare I say this, if you're not facing opposition in your life, it's time you move. Because if you're not facing opposition, you're not doing something you should be doing. Because you're either advancing the kingdom or you're going to grumble against it. And I'm going to go a step further in that. And you'll get it here. Because when this opposition came against David, and he chose not to, there was one thing and one reason why David didn't allow opposition to come against him. Because David's gaze was fixed somewhere else. And this jumped out at me so much because there was three times he said it within the, what I read. See, David's eyes were not on the battle. David's eyes were not on the giant. The only thing that David saw was that there was this man that was defying the God of Israel. He says three times in verse 26, he says, Who is this man that defies the armies of the living God? In verse 36, he says, I have defeated the lion and the bear, and I will defeat this man who defies the armies of the living God. In verse 45, he says to Goliath, I come after you in the name of God, whom you have defied. And I had to do a self-check here. And it was a scary self-check, because when I first read this, I literally asked my question, am I defying the God of Israel? See, we think that it's something that we come up against God. We come up against Him and we're like, God, I don't like you. God, I... If you look up that word, defied, not in the Bible, in the dictionary, it basically means opposing, doing the opposite. Let me ask you a question. 
The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. What is your confession? God says, I bore my stripes. I bore these for your healing. You are healed. Are you confessing you're healed or are you sick? See, I had to do a self-check at this moment because immediately if I say, oh God, this is mine. Don't get me wrong. If you have a cold, if you're sniffled, I'm not saying anything. But if the doctor diagnoses you with something, if you remember the last time I spoke, when the doctor told me I wouldn't walk because of my knee without medical help, if I had walked at that moment and said, God, the doctor says that I have, it's called Osgood's Ladder Syndrome, in my knee, I would have just claimed something and I would have been defying God's word. If God has said that he's going to take care of me, as he takes care of the birds, that I should not worry, and I take on worry, I am in defiance of the God of Israel. See, I had to do a self-check at that moment. Am I defying you, God? And I became quick to repent. Because if you're defying God, I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm saying be quick to repent. Because this was my scary reflection on me, was that I do not want to be in defiance of the God of Israel and have God raise up somebody else to let me know that I am in defiance of God. I want to be able to know that if I am defying you, God, I am sorry and I repent and I churn. Because as long as I am in defiance of the God of Israel, I cannot take down my giant because I am walking out of covenant. Church, I challenge you. David, his eyes were focused on God. He was looking at God. He wasn't concerned that there was a giant. I truly believe that when David looked and saw the giant, he just saw a bigger target for him to hit. He was looking and going, now I know who my giant is, and that's an easy target right there. So you've got to understand, church, that God is calling you to move and to do something. And I'm telling you this, not because I'm trying to stir you up because I want more people on media or stir you up because the children on the children's side need something. I'm doing this because I was there after serving my whole life, and I was content to come in and have none of you know me. But we get so focused on ourselves. It's not about you. Will you go to heaven? Oh, yes. You'll still go to heaven. But what about? Let me ask you a question. And this is not about me. But if I had been content to sit there and come in Sunday after Sunday and leave out these doors, what about all of you that I'm affecting right now? I learned quickly it's not about me. It's about the five, the two, the one, the hundred people that you're going to reach because you've shifted your gaze from me and you shifted your gaze to God and what he's actually called you to do. And then I got excited. Because at this moment, when David faced the giant, and he saw the giant, and he had built himself up, Goliath was still talking smack, like the rest of them. And what did David do? David ran. But not like the rest of the warriors he looked at his giant, and he said, you will be mine today because you defied God. And he ran at his giant. He was ready to take down his giant. <laughs> See, your life is going to change. And here's the thing. Is when you look at 1 Samuel 20, it all began, 1 Samuel 17, 20, it all began with a very simple thing. And it says, and so David rose up. 
See, when you look at Joshua 1-2, when God called Joshua and he said, I want you to go possess the land, the very beginning of that says, Joshua, arise. You see, church, it's time we rise up. And I want to tell you why. I need to get you guys to come up. I am closing. And I'll tell you why. And this is where I get excited because... Again, when I tell you something, it's because I've experienced it. And I'm coming down. You see, I had a conversation with somebody recently here in this church. It's not a secret, it was Luana. And... Huh? No, no, no. It's about me. And I told her that I had a conversation with somebody in the city... And when I spoke to them in this city, I think I caught them off guard. And this is somebody who's known me since I set foot in this city. And I spoke to them, and as I started speaking to them, I started preaching at them. And basically the gist of the conversation was I told them, you talk about unity. But if you have odds against your brother, if you have odds against her, if she has odds against him, then you're not walking in love. And if you're not walking in love, then don't talk to me about unity because you can't walk in unity if you're not walking in love. And that conversation ended very fast. And my comment to Loanna was, see, they weren't expecting that the Curtis that they know knew isn't the Curtis they were talking with this day. Because the Curtis that you knew last year is not the Curtis that's standing in front of you today. The Curtis that you knew last week is not the Curtis standing in front of you today. Because church, it's time that we rise up. And I can tell you the exact moment that I made that choice. See, I remember the day I was home and this was about a year and a half ago. And Shannon had been driving to work. And she was on the highway. So she was going over 100. I won't tell how fast because we're in church. She was going over 100. And I got a phone call from her saying, Curtis, I've gone off the highway. See, now, I'm not a person that fears. If anybody knows me, my dad raised me, there's no fear. You don't fear anything. You assess the situation and then you move. And immediately I said, okay, I'm on my way. So I got there. And just before you get to the church, you're coming up the highway, there's a churn. And she had been driving over 100 and she hit a piece of black ice and she spun out. And as she spun out, she went down in the ditch and she slid sideways, she went up the other side of the ditch. Now I know my wife, and anytime there's any trouble, I can guarantee you that the first words that come out of her mouth are Jesus. I can guarantee you. And at that moment, I knew she was fine. But I got there. And I got on the side of that highway and I'm looking at the vehicle and I, I'm immediately, I'm like, wow. And the truck driver comes up to us and this is what he says, she is lucky because going at the speed that she was going, her car should have hit that side of that ditch and started flipping and going up the other side of the ditch. Cause she didn't just go down the ditch, she went down, she went up and she went up the other side. It wasn't luck, I know that because I know that she confessed God in that exact moment. But I will tell you, church, it got me angry because as I stood there with watching her vehicle, I watched 30 plus cars come around that churn going over 100 and not one of them hit that black piece of ice. What happened to it? Not one person lost their traction. They kept telling me, you need to step away. And I'm going, no, no, I'm watching something. You see, it wasn't a piece of black ice, the enemy was trying to take out something. 
And see, this is where I decided I was going to rise up. And we got her off to work, and I remember, oh, there was a righteous anger getting in me. And I went home, and I walked in my entry, and the first place that I get to in my entry, as soon as you pass it, is my kitchen. And I just set foot in my kitchen, and I was angry. And the first thing that came out of my mouth was, devil, now you got to understand, church, when you step up a level, I'm not pleading with God. At this moment, I'm not going, God, please deliver. God, please. No, no, no. I'm rising up. And I'm going to take out this giant. And I will tell you exactly what happened in this conversation. Right there in my kitchen, I said, devil, how dare you come against my family? How dare you step against my wife? How dare you come against my future children? And I right there, I went, oh, no, 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 no. Devil, you've made a mistake this day. See, devil, this day you've awoken a sleeping giant within me. from the beginning and I said it at the end it's not about you because here's the thing I've defeated some giants in my life is that going to stop them from coming? no but here's the thing Eugene has faced some giants I may never face Luana has faced some giants I may never face Temi has faced some giants I may never face. There's somebody that's going to come in here that's going to face a giant that I've never faced. It's time that as the church we rise up because when we assemble as one, when Temi comes here and he makes it not about himself but a priority to be here and Eugene makes a priority to be here and Luana makes a priority to be here I may have defeated three giants but when we assemble we've now faced many giants and that's four of us can you imagine if each one of us faced one giant has defeated one giant in our life a hundred giants have fallen in this room. And when that person needs something because a giant is rearing his ugly face against them, when we assemble, there's no giant we can't take down. I may not know how to defeat it, but Eugene does. I may not know how to defeat it, but Luana does. Church, we're about to take down some giants. But we can only take down those giants if you choose to not be about you and decide to rise up. Because when you rise up, oh, the devil's scared. Because he's about to wake up. He's going to wake up. And he's going to know that we're not sitting back anymore. We're not just going to walk into a place. And somebody goes, did you see that giant? By the time they get a chance to say, did you, I'm going to be running for that giant. And I'm going to take that giant down before they even get a chance to tell me what the giant has done. But first, I will challenge you, church. Self-check yourself as I did. Are you defying the God of Israel? If you have, don't get down on yourself. It just means repent, because I will tell you, I have defied the God of Israel. At some point, I guarantee you I have, but I will tell you, I have repented, and I've taken down more giants than have ever come up against me.
and I will continue to do it. Rise up, church. This is the day that you make that decision to proclaim God. No longer looking at your giant, no longer listening to the grumbling, no longer giving an ear to the enemy. You let him know and set him on notice that the giant within is about to take him down in every aspect of your life. Praise you, God. With every head bowed, we always make sure that we do this. We always want to give an opportunity that if you don't know God, that you have the opportunity before you leave this house. If you'd like to let, if you'd like to get to know the God of Israel, the God who has called us, the God who will take down anything that tries to come up against you. If you don't know him and you'd like to, I want to invite you to raise your hand. There's no shame in it. We've all done it. And that's why we're here. And if you do want to, raise your hand. And if you're on live stream, we're going to pray a prayer. Join us. Let's pray, church. God, I thank you that you died for me. I repent of my sin. And I turn to you, Father. Come into my heart and forgive me and be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We want to welcome you guys if you prayed that prayer. Now for the rest of us, and I am closing, I do want you to know that some things that I may have said could have been harsh along the way, but I speak because I've experienced it. And I've had to walk through that valley in my life when I made it about me. But when I quickly learned that it wasn't, I became so much more effective for the kingdom. You, whoever you are in this place, God has a calling on your life, every single one of you. It's time we rise up as the church because there are so many people out there that are just begging for us because they don't know what else to do. And I want you to know, and I can tell you from a leadership standpoint, and I speak on behalf of every leader here, we're here with you. And we will run into that battle with you. We won't stand back. We won't grumble. We won't look at those giants. We will grab you and we will run with you. And we'll slay every last one of them. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you guys so much. Remember the cafe is closed. Go and enjoy family this weekend. But next weekend, Pastor Brian is here. And something exciting is going to happen. We don't come just because we like to talk. God speaks to us. Come and hear him and you will be blessed. God, I thank you for everybody here. I pray a blessing upon everybody and I thank you, Lord God, that our mind and our eyes are focused on you. And Lord, I pray a blessing on everybody as they go. And we thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.